probably almost 20 before I start. All right, sorry, I forgot to hit record after all we talked about. Um, thank you, Laura. Uh, so I have been hunting, I would say I've been going hunting with my parents uh, since I was, they'd had me in a backpack on their back uh, from rural Montana, shared Montana, Southwest Montana. Uh, I was the only girl in my hunter education class at, at 12. Um, I was kind of the only girl that I, I mean, my mom, besides my mom, we were the only ones that really went out hunting. So it wasn't something that a lot of women that I knew did. And so even when I went to the University of Montana in Missoula, I didn't meet a lot of other uh, girls or women who hunted or had an interest in it. And then I started working for Fish, Wildlife and Parks and I found my people. So uh, it's just a really nice, really nice to be able to connect with all the people that I work with. And um, they're just as passionate about it as I am. And so that's kind of where this program came about as well as we, uh, we know there are people out there who have the interest and might not have someone that they can ask or um, might feel intimidated because there is so much that goes into getting, getting started. And so we hoped we could kind of break down some of those barriers and uh, help you kind of learn, you know, next steps, uh, who to contact for what, um, just kind of the basics so that you feel more comfortable and confident uh, and decide if you really do want to hunt, if that's something that you want to move forward to do. All right. So um, why do we hunt? And I think this is a really important question. And it's one that I always ask when I teach hunter education, uh, because sometimes people don't really stop to think about why they really want to hunt. Um, for me, even growing up, it was just something that we did as a family. I never really thought about it until I got older and um, started to see, oh, not everyone does what I do. So why, why do I really do, do this? And I'm gonna show you guys a couple uh, photos here. Um, I believe this one is yours, Jesse. Do you want us to just tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the, <laughs> this, one's, this one actually holds a few things. Um, so you just get beautiful scenery. Beautiful scenery is one of the main reasons I do anything outside because I love it. But <laughs> You know that in the picture my dad and my husband are both in there it was this was this past season we went out out in eastern montana and we're just getting a hunt so i get to spend you know like a week with my dad which i don't normally get to do you get to go hang out we used to live over here so it was like a time to go revisit a place that i had spent some time and really enjoyed um the scenery is amazing it's just it's a uh, yeah i just that was a that was a really good day for me it was a super fun day it was a long day, beautiful sunset, beautiful sunrise, or a sunset and sunrise. Um, we saw all kinds of, we saw a big sage grouse that day. I mean, it was just all kinds of things. That that picture is a very, a, a lot of things that most people don't see to me. All right. Oh, there went my lights. <laughs> oh, let me go back. Okay, Laura, can you tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah, so I hunt for a lot of reasons. Just like Jesse said, I love the outdoors and I love seeing new things. And it seems like every time you go, even if you go to the same spot hunting, you can still see new stuff, whether it's animals or sunsets or sunrises, which is so neat because a lot of pe people don't get that experience. And kind of like Sarah said too, we kind of just grew up hunting like it, you know, it wasn't a question. It's like, well, we're going hunting this weekend, get your stuff packed, you know? And so that's kind of what I've instilled with my kids too. So this was my son Maverick last year. And so I have a son Maverick, he's four. And I have a daughter, Olivia, who is about a year and a half. And they've both been hunting since they were little. We put them in our packs. Um, Olivia was actually two months old on her first deer hunt. So that was kind of fun. And this, this picture was from last year, so not the 2019, and it was pretty fun because Maverick was finally at the age where he, like, he enjoyed going out with us, you know, it'd be like, okay, Mav, we're gonna go hunting, so he would go pack his orange, he would grab his wood gun, and he was so excited to go out, and I remember this day because it was me and my dad and Mav, and we drove around all day, and he thought the best thing about hunting is eating snacks. He just loves going because he can eat the good food we bring. 
And I'm sure when I go out with the kids, I pack enough to be gone for a whole week. And we are almost getting ready to come back to town. And I was like, Mav, if you see any more deer, remember mom has a license, we can shoot one. And he said, okay. And so he sees one right outside the door, like almost as we're to the highway. And he's like, mom, can you shoot that one? And I said, yeah, we can. He's like, jump out quick, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. And luckily we put a great shot on it. It dropped right there. And he was so excited because he loved field dressing it. Him and my dad drug it to the forerunner. He got to help load it. And it's just such good memories. Awesome. I've got another one for Jesse to talk about. This is a, a similar place as out Eastern Montana again, a couple years ago. Again, my dad and I just had some really good quality time together. This was just he and I this year. Um, just saw these, I mean, Eastern Montana, a lot of times you just drive through it and that's it and you don't see much, but you get out there and you see these amazing, like this is just sandstone that's been carved out by the wind and the snow and the rain. And it's just this beautiful, beautiful rock. And, you know, like Laura said, you just see new things that you, you didn't even know were there to see. And it's just super fun. Uh, yeah, that's a cool photo. I don't hunt in Eastern Montana. So it was really fun to look at your guys' photos. How about this one, Laura? This was um, a few years back before I had kids and I drew a special deer permit up on the Marias River. So I packed my adopted grandpa and my dad and my two brothers. We went up there and like, you know, my dad always said with us when we're hunting, like it's all about the memories. And we just laid on the grass and giggled and laughed. And it just, it makes me laugh thinking about us because <laughs> I don't even know what we were giggling about. You know, that's awesome. So yeah, it's, it's kind of fun just sharing, like having those pictures and thinking back at all the silly things you did. And I do remember this trip because my youngest brother, he he's always a comedian. He's kind of like Wade here. <laughs> and we were down on a river bottom and there was a bunch of cattails. And we always tease him because he always has to have snacks. And so he grabbed one of the cattails and he turned around to us and he's like, do you guys have any mustard? He's like, I just found a field of corn dogs. And so we always just make each other laugh. You know, we don't always shoot something or harvest an animal, but at least we giggle and have fun. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, I think you guys can see just from these couple of pictures um, what strong memories you make when you're out there. Again, even if you're not harvesting an animal, hunting just really is a reason to get out and experience new things, new places and um, build memories with the people you care about. So this is one of mine. These are my boots because <laughs> I'm taking the picture. Um, and this is my husband. And when I met him, he had never hunted in his life. So it was kind of a role reversal for me to, you know, try to teach him how to hunt um, with him coming from a background of never having had any interest in it. Um, and now he's probably a more avid hunter than I am. But we sat out here, it was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I took a video a few minutes later, we had 10 does probably just, I mean, they walked right, right by us. It was just the coolest thing to watch. Um, these deer just walk right by us. We had the wind in the right direction. They couldn't smell us. And we just sat there and watched them. And it was a really kind of just neat bonding experience with him. Um, and I, again, I go with my family a lot. Uh, this is where I grew up. This is where you know, this is where my childhood was. So it's, it's a really nostalgic thing for me to come back here and hunt every year. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of reasons why we hunt and, um, you know, we talk about food is definitely one of them, but, uh, making these memories and having these experiences with people is, is a huge one. And then the last one, if you didn't know how much we liked sunrises and sunsets, I just wanted to make sure that you knew there is literally, I mean, again, I'm usually not up early enough to see these things or out maybe late enough to see these unless I'm out hunting uh, because you do usually start pretty early and end pretty late. But uh, Montana in the morning and in the evenings that time of year is just breathtaking. So if for nothing else, sunsets and sunrises. All right. 
So some other reasons uh, why we hunt, and everyone has their own reasons, obviously. Um, a big one is ownership and what we eat. And again, growing up, I didn't really think about it that often, but you know, venison made up a pretty big part of our diet. That was just kind of what, again, what we had. And then when I, you know, went off to school, I was like, oh, everyone doesn't live on venison all year. And they were like, what's venison? <laughs> so um, something that I kind of took for granted uh, as a child, um, enjoying the adventures, Jesse and Laura both talked about that. Just the amazing things uh, that you can see in adventures you can have. Um, I might see, you know, Jesse, if you wanted to talk a little bit about hunting as a management tool. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm an animal lover. So people are, I, you know, I did wildlife rehab and all this kind of stuff. So people are always like, you hunt. And I was like, well, yeah. And they were like, I don't understand it. You love animals, but you can kill them. And I was like, well, yeah. I mean, it's not something I don't, the killing part is not a part I enjoy. Every single time I kill something, I cry. My husband's just like, okay, you done? Like, I'm like, okay, just give me a minute. I say my thanks. I shed my couple tears and then I suck it up and I move on. And, and you know, I, I do love to eat it. I love to be out there. The killing itself is the worst part for me. Obviously not a much, as much of a deterrent as you might think, but it's for a lot of places, it, it is a, it's a management tool as far as these populations, you know, there's only so much of a population that a certain plot of land can, can sustain, or there's, you know, certain areas where it doesn't work well agriculturally. And so it's a, it's a big management tool in a lot of different aspects in which you're helping to create a better environment for others, other animals included. Um, so it, it seems a little bit like a, how do you do that if you like them? But it, there is a bigger picture. It's not just that, it's not a microcosm. It is a, it has a bigger impact throughout. And typically it's a positive impact if you're doing it properly. Yes, very well said. Um, and Laura, would you want to talk about the conservation aspect of it? Yeah, and I just wanted to chime in too, kind of on what Jesse said too. Um, one part of us too, like I'm an animal lover too. And it, you know, like I've talked to people like, especially um, kids when they start hunting, you know, cause it is sad and it's okay to be sad if you kill something. But what makes me feel better about it too is how we use every part of that animal. You know, um, it just depends how people process it themselves but we take it home and hang it. And then it's like, just that bonding we have with our family as far as butchering it together and, I mean, it, it really helps to know where your meat comes from and, you know, kind of have that sense of ownership for it too, which I know Sarah kind of brushed on that earlier too. And, and I feel like the conservation aspect, it, you know, kind of ties in directly what Jesse said and how it is a management tool. I think those two go hand in hand with each other. Yeah, and a lot of the revenue that goes towards buying licenses, um, even buying firearms and ammunition, a lot of that money comes right back to agencies like Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And it's used for um, habitat conservation projects uh, that are gonna, you know, make places better that, it, you know, maybe we hunt there once a year, but we hike there, we camp there, you know, these wildlife management areas in Montana, um, people enjoy them year round. And the, the funding that comes from hunting, you know, plays a huge role in the conservation efforts that we're able to accomplish as an agency. And I'm just going to add on something that you guys had both said earlier, the ownership and what we eat is, it's a, <laughs> my husband and I joke, it's, you know, we, we call ourselves habitarians. We like to eat animals who have lived a happy life. And so we're like, they had a really happy life and one really bad moment. Um, so that's, I mean, it's, it, at least I know when I kill it, it's, it's lived its life. It's lived a, a good wildlife. And when I kill it, if I'm doing it right, which I intend to do every single time, it's a very quick death. Um, and then <laughs> Sarah was talking about, you know, not everybody eats venison. I was probably eight years old and my parents were really excited to feed my sister and I something. And we got it and it smelled funny and it looked a little weird and we both tasted it and we thought mom had ruined our dinner. We thought she ruined this meat. 
and my my sister and I look at each other and we're just like oh my god we just made this face and my parents just started howling my dad was like what is wrong with you two and we're like mom screwed it up you know it's <laughs> it tastes terrible and they just howled they were like it's beef we had never had beef before and it was just the weirdest tasting thing in the world yeah it's, it can be very different and something we are going to talk about later on in the series is you know after you have harvested an animal how to take care of that meat and properly handle it and properly cook it so that it can be a super enjoyable um, source of protein in your life so um, again these are just some of the reasons why we hunt again people have very personal reasons um, they're different for folks so I would just uh, ask all of you to think about it tonight um, or throughout the presentation and, and think about you know your top top two or three reasons why you're really interested in this and want to get into hunting. So I, I definitely wanted us to talk about the realities of hunting because I think, you know, in this day and age, social media, TV, um, YouTube, all of these things, uh, if, you're, if you're kind of looking up hunting, you might see a lot of things that probably are not super realistic. Um, especially in Montana, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to hunt in different places, depending on laws and regulations and um, environments and things. But I really wanted to talk about the realities of it, because I think if you go into it kind of having a very clear idea of, of what it really is like, uh, it's going to be better for, <laughs> better for you in the long run. Um, so the, the, something we've already touched on quite a few times actually, is this idea of the act of hunting versus actually harvesting an animal. And so I know when I go out and I'm hunting, if I harvest an animal, that's great. If I don't harvest an animal, I still probably had a really enjoyable day. And that's not a failure to me. I know people who go out and if they don't harvest anything, it's a failure. That day was wasted. And I think um, at least for me, and I, I would guess Jesse and Laura as well, uh, those days are just as precious to us as days that we actually harvest something. And so, you know, just knowing that if you go out for a day and you don't harvest something, you didn't fail. You just didn't harvest anything that day. Um, I think that's a big one. Do you ladies have any thoughts on that? Just to agree with you, that's a huge part. I mean, you know, we talked about that at the very first thing. I go out there to see the scenery, to see the new stuff that's out there, to see what animals are out there. I mean, a lot of times you see animals that you're not looking to harvest. Um, and it's, you know, I was hunting deer and I saw a sage grouse and I was, that made my day. I love sage grouse. They're the coolest thing. And I was just like, I don't care what else we see today. I saw a sage grouse. I was so excited. Um, but it's, yeah, harvesting is great. When I have a full freezer, that's amazing. But probably three quarters of my hunting <laughs> is just me being outside, hanging out, enjoying the sights, seeing cool things and having fun, making memories. Definitely. Yeah, I have to agree with what they said. And, you know, my dad always said, if we harvest something, that's a bonus, you know, mm -hmm. so we should be thankful if we harvest something, but, you know, just getting out and enjoying everything. And I mean, just like those two said, I I remember the days that we didn't harvest something, maybe even more because we saw something that was neat or, you know, had a good snack along the way or, you know, did something that made each other laugh. I mean, that's just as an enjoyable to us. Yeah, definitely. Um, the next one I thought we'd talk about is it's usually not like the TV shows. So that probably applies to a lot of things in our lives, <laughs> but it's probably usually not like the TV shows. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you guys have watched any hunting shows, but they're usually guided. They're usually, um, they might be in like a tree stand. Um, in some states, you can actually have bait out, like bait, uh, corn attractants to bring in deer. You can't do that in Montana. Um, and so when they're, you know, sitting in these tree stands and shooting like 10 by 10 deer, um, that's not usually the reality, especially in Montana. We just don't kind of, we just don't really have those kind of environments here. Uh, people will hunt out of tree stands. Usually archery hunting, um, takes place in tree stands, but you, you know, Montana, it's a rugged place. It's a mountainous place. 
you're probably going to have to work for it in Montana. Uh, even out in Eastern Montana, there's a lot of ground to cover and it's probably not, you know, someone with all her makeup on and her brand new camo sitting in a tree stand harvesting a world record deer. So, um, which I'm happy about, you know, I'm pretty glad that we have kind of the, the terrain and the, the ha habitat that we have here, because I mean, when you harvest an animal in Montana, usually you put in some pretty good work for it. And it, it's just, uh, I think it makes it more worthwhile and special because of that. And what I think too is kind of deceiving about the TV shows is you see someone that they just are, you know, come on, come over here. We're going to sit by the fence here. And then all of a sudden, all these animals just appear like five minutes after they sat there. And that is not real life. I mean, my husband and I both drew doe antelope licenses this year. And I can't tell you how many miles we put on just to find out where those stinking antelope were. You know, and that's just finding them. Then you got to figure out how to sneak up on them and they're in the middle of a field. And, you know, with the TV shows, everything's the most perfect scenario. They don't show you how many hours someone's been scouting or, you know, how long it's taken to find the, ant the deer, the elk or whatever they're hunting. But that's the things that we enjoy going out doing. And that's how we bond with our families or see the scenery or, you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And rest assured, I have never gotten anything close to what you would call even sort of a trophy. <laughs> I got like a fork and horn buck and I'm like, yeah, I got one. <laughs> it's, it's not about the antlers for me. It's about the meat. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think a lot of the TV shows put a pretty heavy emphasis on the antlers. Um, whereas again, for us, for me, it's about the meat and usually, you know, the younger, the younger ones are probably going to taste better. So, um, so yeah, it's, you know, don't, don't expect the hunt to go down like your favorite reality TV show. Um, so I put, you'll probably miss an animal at some point. So we'll, you'll probably a hundred percent miss an animal at some point. I should have also put lose an animal at some point. And that's something that we're going to talk more about later, because when I say lose an animal, I mean that you've taken a shot, you probably hit the animal, and that animal gets away from you. You cannot find it, you cannot track it. And that's a pretty downhearted situation to be in, but it's something that I kind of want you to know ahead of time and kind of mentally prepare for if you know that you're gonna be doing this and you wanna pursue hunting. Um, I've, I've, I, I have to say, I've never lost an animal, which is I think pretty rare, but I've also not taken a lot of shots that people have told me to take. So, you know, um, I'm very, very careful about it just because I would be absolutely heartbroken if I ever lost an animal and it, it happens. It's a reality. And I think, um, again, you kind of want to be mentally prepared to know that it's something that might happen to you and how you're going to deal with that after the fact. Yeah, I have lost an animal and it was, it, you know, I, it was a, easy shot it was a great shot it sounded like it hit well it looked like it hit well we gave it a minute and then we went to look for the deer and it was followed a blood trail followed the tracks it disappeared and we looked for probably three or four hours because I because like Sarah said it was just heartbreaking I was like I just killed something and it's nowhere to be found maybe it maybe it was a worse shot than I thought and it didn't kill it but I I burned my tag I I notched it and just put it away because I I didn't feel right trying to shoot another one after that yeah that's something we'll definitely be talking about more this this idea of um ethics and emotions which are both pretty big deals in hunting so and I have to agree, it, you know, missing an animal. I recall two animals that I'm, I've missed or lost. And one was like five years ago. And one was probably 15 years ago. And it's still gut-wrenching. Like you just, you can picture it all and see it all. And it's just hard. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely a hard thing. Um, and something that if you go in kind of knowing that, again, you know, very rarely do you see people on TV not get that animal. Uh, and so it's just another reality that I, I want people to be aware of. Um, and the last one I have on here, there's probably more, but 
there is a lot to learn. And you guys probably know that because you're here with us and you're going to go through this series. But uh, I mean, there is just even working in this agency, there's so much more to it than I ever thought, you know, growing up again, I took a lot of things for granted. And I had people that had been hunting their whole lives that were there to teach me. And um, when I started to kind of get into teaching hunter education to other people, um, learning how much, you know, other people need to learn and that it's not just, you know, it's not something they grew up doing. They didn't know anyone that, that, um, I it really, when I started teaching my husband, I would just look at him and be like, what do you mean? You don't know. And he's like, I never did this for 30 years or whatever. So, um, it really put things in perspective for me, um, when I started teaching others to hunt of just how much there is to learn, it can be really intimidating. So again, we want to hopefully, uh, make this a little easier for you and show you that it's totally doable. And I think Laura, who used to work at one of the, or works at one of the front desks in our Great Falls office, could probably tell you the number of phone calls she gets every day on people calling to ask questions about hunting. <laughs> they do. I mean, it's, it's consistent throughout the year and it's men, women, all different age, age ranges. And I always figure they're just trying to learn, like you have to you know, treat them all the same, start from the beginning. If they don't know how to read the regulations, they're trying to learn. So, you know, sometimes you go into businesses and I feel like they're kind of snappy and it's like, you don't know how to do that. And it's like, well, I sit down at the table and show them and they are so grateful and they come back and ask more questions and you want them to feel that way. You want to have someone that, you know, they feel comfortable asking a question to, or, you know, knowing what resources they need. It's, it's, it's good to be able to teach people that too. I mean, it's really rewarding for me when I can help them answer their questions. Yeah, and I think something I always tell any student that I teach is that I want you to ask me as many questions as you have. There really is no dumb question. And if you ask me these questions now and get answers, it's probably gonna keep you from being out in the field and getting yourself in a really bad situation because you were you know, too intimidated or just really didn't wanna look silly and ask these questions you know, with all these other students that are probably thinking the exact same question as you. Um, so the more you know going out, the more you're prepared, uh, the better experience you're probably gonna have. And one of the things my dad like hammered into my head when I was younger, cause I, I'm definitely a question person. And he's like, you know, if people get mad, that's their own problem. Everybody had to learn. Every single person had to learn. Everybody that's here has never done it before. That's fine. We all had to learn. We were just lucky enough to grow up in families where we learned it as part of our, you know, growing up. It's not, we, we're not doing it better or right. We just happened to be in a situation that was different. So everybody's got to learn. Yes, definitely. Okay. So we're just going to go over this really briefly. This how to get started. That's, that's the big question, right? And that's kind of what we're going to go through step by step in these uh, upcoming series as well. Um, licenses, permits, and deadlines. Oh my! And you might not, you might not even know what I mean between you know what's the difference between a license and a permit. What are the three different deadlines you have to draw for a permit? Even just the vocabulary can be intimidating. And so we're going to spend time um, actually in the next session talking about all these things giving you definitions so that you know, I, I still talk to people in our own agency that use license and permit, they, ex, you know, interchangeably, and that's not, not the case. So it's no wonder people are confused when uh, folks that work for the agency can't even uh, get that information across. So there's a lot of information you need to know, you know, you know, probably starting now, like we started the series now because there are deadlines I believe April 1st, right, Laura, they changed the date. Yeah, so you can start um, purchasing your general licenses and applying for all of these permits starting March 1st, but there is a major deadline for deer and elk permits of April 1st. So it's coming up just around the corner. Yeah, so we'll we'll have our next session before that, but you're going to learn the difference between going into uh, a place and just buying a general license versus do I need to apply for a permit in a special area for antlerless mule deer. Uh, we're going to talk about all that because there's so many choices. Um, we're going to talk about equipment. So 
there's literally a million brands and they all promise you different things. I'm the best. I do, you know, I'm the best pattern of camo. I'm the best, just whatever. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that make a lot of promises and we don't want you to feel like you can't get into this because it's too expensive. Um, you can do it pretty affordably and we'll talk about kind of what you really need to get started and where you should spend the money. If you're going to splurge on something, uh, where that's going to be best spent. So um, we'll talk about that. And then physical fitness is something I think people don't think about a lot. Um, and I've definitely had some times that I was huffing and puffing up a mountainside thinking I really should have been preparing for this. And I'm really not having a great time because I can't breathe. And so, uh, kind of, you know, knowing your limits, knowing how hard you want to hunt, where you want to hunt, the environments you want to hunt in. And again, planning ahead and starting to work on your physical fitness. Uh, you know, it might be one thing to go for a hike or a walk just with your clothes, but when you add boots and you add a coat and you add a backpack and you add a rifle and you add mittens that you can't like like adjust anything, um, things get harder, uh, pretty quickly. So we're going to just kind of talk about the reality of, of that and knowing your limits and also knowing who you're going with and what their limits are. Because, um, I know I've been with people that I was like, uh, I didn't sign up for this. What are we doing right now? Why are we going up the side of a mountain when we don't have to? And for them, one of the reasons they hunt is to go up the sides of mountains and say, Hey, I went up the side of that mountain. And I was like, ah. so, uh, definitely something that people might not think of, but it's a super important to plan ahead for. What do you, do you guys have anything to add? Yeah. How you said you're out of breath going up mountains and hills and you should be in shape. That's me every single time, even if I think I'm in shape. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I'm also the person that's like, hey, there's a mountain. Let's go get the top. Mm -hmm. Jesse's one of those people. <laughs> I'm that yeah. So again, we'll, we'll be covering all that, but these are some of the big ones that can be pretty intimidating for folks getting started. So we're just going to go quickly over, um, over these kind of sessions and give you like a little bit more of a deep dive into what, we're, what we'll be talking about. Um, so licenses, permits, and deadlines. This is a screenshot of the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks website page on hunting in Montana. And if you look to the left, you can see all of the different choices that you have. So if you decide you want to start hunting and you go to this page, where would you even start? I mean, there's like, what, 10, 12 different things that you would have to literally read through all of these to try to get just the briefest idea of what you needed to buy a license. Do you need hunter education? Uh, if you just moved here, how long do you have to live here to be a resident? Uh, there's a lot. So we're gonna cover as much of it as we can in the next session. We actually have a uh, woman game warden who's gonna be helping teach that session as well. Um, and so she's gonna be able to answer any like super technical stuff for us. But between the three of us, we have a pretty good understanding of, of these processes and things, but there's even questions people ask me that I'm like, A, how, where did you come across this thing, problem, whatever? And B, I don't know. Um, and things change. So every year things, things can change. A lot, of, a lot of things stay the same, but things change. And so it's not like you can learn this once and then just you're good. You kind of have to stay up on it every year to make sure that you are following all the regulations. Um, the last thing we want is for you know, something to happen out in the field, a game warden shows up and you lose your hunting license. That's just never a good situation for anyone. So uh, yeah, we're going to talk about this stuff kind of in depth. And like I said, Laura deals with this on a daily basis and knows how, I mean, she's a, probably a walking encyclopedia of hunting knowledge um, because there's just so much. <laughs> I'm definitely the person who like every year I'm like hold on let me just sit down with the regs again because I don't remember any of it so I have to go through all of it like my hunting district I'm like ah what can I hunt there without a permit what can I hunt there like it's I every single year I have to sit down and go through the regulations again yeah and uh it sounds it sounds pretty horrible right but we're going to give you at least some tips and tricks and the things that you really need to focus in on uh so that you can be successful 
I put regulations on my cell phone, you know, I can pull them up, especially when I'm out hunting and I need to know, uh, you know, sunrise and sunset because you can only shoot during certain hours. And, you know, something like that, as easy as that, um, when I don't have cell phone service, I still have the regulations on my phone. If I have any question about, is it too late to shoot? I can just pull them up quickly. Uh, so there's some ways that you can make it a lot easier, but there's definitely, this is probably, I won't say the most information you're going to need, but um, until you kind of learn the vocabulary and the language of hunting, uh, this can be pretty intimidating. And, and if you've looked at the regulations, I mean, it's a book and it can be really intimidating to look at, but I promise everyone that by the end of it, I will make sure you know how to read them and it won't be that hard. I mean, I've helped hundreds of people sit down and learn how to read them and they're very thankful and it's not as confusing once we dig into it. Yeah, we got your back. We got you. So that's going to be our next one in March. The one after that, we're going to talk about gear and equipment. And this one is really fun just because, again, there's a million brands and some people, uh, I think I'm going to say this, I don't know if it's true, but I think some people's goals when they're hunting is to see who can have the best gear, who can have the most gear, who can have the techiest gear, who can have the newest gear. Um, so if you, if you know someone like that, you probably shouldn't hunt with them, or you might be spending thousands of dollars trying to keep up with their, their gear. Um, but we're just going to talk about what you absolutely need to get started. Um, you know, what you should splurge on if you're going to splurge and, um, finding a firearm that fits you. We're going to talk about finding, um, fit on a firearm. I've met a lot of women who come to shotgun classes and, They've had really bad experiences because their significant other or family member gives them a gun that's too big for them. And one, it's terrifying when you have a gun that's too heavy for you, you can't get a good grip on it. And two, it hurts. So I've, I've gotten bruising before and I'm a fairly big gal. Um, I've gotten bruising before shooting a rifle of my dad's because the caliber was so big that it just it just bruised me. Like I never wanted to shoot that, that firearm again. So we don't want you to have that experience or hopefully if you already had that experience, um, we can kind of bring you back over to like, Hey, it's okay. If you find something that fits you, it's not supposed to hurt. It's not supposed to make you fl fly backwards. Um, even my husband had to find this out the hard way, uh, not, not having a gun that fit him and he, he shot it. He didn't have a good enough grip and the scope came up, it, it kicked back and cut him right, right here on the forehead. And I said, well, I told you that was, that wasn't going to fit you, but he did it. He got cut. He learned a lesson. Um, but yeah, we'll talk, we'll give you some tips and tricks on, on where to, where to shop for a firearm, um, how to try some different ones out, things like that. Um, practice, practice shooting, practice packing your gear, practice, um, there's a lot of things you can practice and do ahead of time that is going to make your experience a lot better. Uh, we'll talk about making it affordable again. You don't have to go buy everything new right away. Uh, I don't know what, I guess some people could afford that. <laughs> I sure couldn't. Um, but I have been building my, my stash for years and I, I love secondhand shopping. I love sale shopping. Um, so you can really make it affordable, uh, if you try. And again, Physical fitness, we'll talk about that more with gear because um, you're probably going to have a pack, you're going to have a rifle that's fairly heavy. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that as far as kind of what you can do to get prepared so that you don't go out on, on you know, the opening day hunting season with a brand new pack filled with all of your new gear that you've never carried before and try to go up the side of a mountain. So <laughs> anything to add, ladies? Well, my first deer I ever shot, I probably didn't practice shooting enough and I did the same as your husband. I came back and I had cut myself all above my eye and I was with my dad and my two younger brothers and my mom, I remember, was so mad at me because I had cut my eye and my eye was still bleeding and I was trying to tell her about my deer and she was worried about my eye and, you know. Yeah. You can learn from our mistakes. <laughs> over the years. Anything else, Jesse, or shall I move on? Okay, we're headed on. 
Uh, the next one, it's called The Hunt, and that'll be in May. And this is the actual, you're going out, you're hunting, um, where to hunt? Huge question. I hear it all the time. Um, I'm sure Laura hears it all the time. How do you even know where to go? Um, public land, private land, easements, um, wildlife management areas, block management. I mean, there's there's a lot of, again, vocabulary and a lot of public land and places you can hunt that you might not know about. And we'll talk to you about some other kind of tools and some an app that you can use that is really helpful. Um, what to expect when you're actually out hunting. Uh, that one might be a little hard, but because you always go out expecting one thing. And then I found that I get out there and then something happens completely different to what I expected. <laughs> Uh, not bad, just, you know, something will jump up in front of me here or there, or, uh, you know, just things. Hunting is, is uh, unpredictable sometimes. Uh, who to hunt with? We covered this a little bit. You know, do you really want to go with the person that, you know, thinks that having 100 pieces of gear is the best, best way to hunt or those people that want to, you know, go up the side of a mountain and then heaven forbid they shoot something and they have to get it back down the mountain. Um, so there's definitely things you want to think about when you choose hunting partners. Uh, you know, two people that have never hunted before going out together, it can work. But if you can find folks that have a little bit of experience to go out with the first time, I think that's always uh, rec what I would recommend. And then this idea of ethics and emotions and both come into play pretty heavily when you're hunting. Um, emotions for a lot of reasons we've talked about, you know, actually the, the act of killing an animal, um, for me is very emotional to this day, or me not packing enough snacks and going up the side of a mountain and then slipping in some mud. And then I get very emotional <laughs> and I say many things to my husband. So, you know, it's normal, like emotions, we have them, they're going to come into play and, um, ethics. And we'll talk more about the ethics, you know, this, this idea of, if something's legal, uh, but maybe it's not ethical to you, like, what are you going to do or vice versa? Um, so that'll be a, a kind of, it's a, it's always an interesting conversation in the classes that we teach. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it'll give you kind of a better picture, kind of holistic picture of the actual hunt that you go on. And I think on that one too, the who you hunt with for me ties in very much to the ethics and emotions. I am not going to go with somebody who does something that is different ethically than I will. Um, I just am not comfortable with that. If I don't think they've got good ethics, I don't want to be a part of it. Um, and you know, the same thing, like I told you guys, I cry every single time I kill something. So somebody who's going to, you know, be like, you're an idiot. No, nah, not, I don't need that. This is my way to do things. I'm not going to go with you if that's how you're going to be. So I think those who you hunt with and the ethics and emotions can be very, very tied together too. Mm -hmm. I think with all those too, I think uh, one of the biggest things is just being comfortable with everything, being comfortable who you're going with, being comfortable if you're going to hike up the side of the mountain with Jesse, you know, you got to have your comfort and you, you can't let people push you to mm -hmm. somewhere out of your comfort level. Yeah, that's so important. And I, again, I grew up with a dad who was constantly pushing me out of my comfort level, which is probably why I didn't enjoy hunting as much growing up as I do now. Um, just because that's the way he was raised. That's the, you know, hunting, this is the way we hunt. And it's, you know, I have a whole new reality about that now, but um, there were a lot of times when he would get pretty upset with me when I wouldn't take a shot that he said I should take and, you know, things like that. So um, not not giving into peer pressure, especially if you're going with people uh, that you don't know very well. Um, it's, it's a big deal. So just something to, that we'll talk about more. And I, th I think there's a big difference too. I hate to, you know, say men and women are different, but I think there's a different way of like pushing men sometimes versus pushing a woman, you know, past their comfort level, how you do it, the words you, you use, you know, and even, you know, when I take my kids um, with Mav, you know, I always tell them every time we get out of the car, I said, you need to make sure to tell me if you're thirsty, if you're hungry, if you're tired, if you want to go back, mm -hmm. you know, and then I just have to be okay with that too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good, uh, a good thought, Laura. Um, even when I go with, with people, um, 
you know, their expectations are probably different than mine. So we try to talk about that ahead of time. Like, this is how far we're going to go. You know, we, we try to be on the same page so that we don't get to a certain point. And then we're all saying, well, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further until we're, until we're all angry and throwing uh, pistachios at each other or something. So, okay. And then the last one in the series is going to be after the hunt. Um, this could be after the harvest as well, but field dressing. And I think field dressing is such an intimidating topic. Um, it can be really hard to try to teach field dressing without being able to be hands-on, but we've got some, some ways that we think that we can get it done, but just know you can do it. You can totally do it. Um, it's not something that you have to be super afraid of. There are things you need to take into consideration. But again, if you're going to be um, out hunting and harvesting this meat, this is just another step in that process. And the more you do it, the more comfortable, the better you're going to get at it. So we're definitely going to talk about that. We're going to talk about safely transporting your meat, because if you spend all this time and energy, you know, going out and then harvesting an animal, um, having the meat spoil because it's not handled properly would just be the worst. Um, so yeah, they're definitely transporting it too. <laughs> transporting it. Yeah. Legally. Legally. Yep. There's some legal concerns. Um, we're going to talk about chronic wasting disease, which is a concern in Montana now. Um, CWD, you'll probably, if you haven't heard of it, you're going to hear about it. Um, it's something that you just need to know about uh, if you're going to want to eat wild game. Um, processing the meat, cutting it up. How do you do that? Do, can you take it somewhere? Do it yourself? Things like that. And then uh, we'll just throw out some kind of, you know, our favorite recipes or tips for cooking. So again, you know, you have to treat venison like any other meat. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Uh, if you do it wrong, it can turn out pretty bad. So we'll just kind of give you some, uh, you know, 11 herbs and spices to, to help you uh, tips and tricks to, to make it turn out for the best. So anything else to add about that, ladies? No, I think with all of it, right after field dressing, I like how you wrote, you can do it. I think that's what the whole it. thing. Yeah, you absolutely. Can do it. And it's, uh, I don't, I love it. It's like a little challenge to me. And I'm like, okay, can I get the cleanest cut possible and as much meat off this bone as possible? My husband just stands back and he's like, you do it. You're way better at it. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> there's, there's also, I mean, I'm going to throw out a crazy number, a thousand different ways to field dress an animal. Uh, not everyone does it the same way. So just because you do it differently than someone else doesn't mean that's wrong. Uh, there's just, there's different ways people do things and get in the habit of doing things. So, um, we'll definitely be talking about that. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. It's almost eight o'clock already. But if you have any questions that you guys want to throw at us right now, we'd be happy to answer those. If not, we'll let you continue on about your evening and hopefully we'll see you at the next series and we'll really dive into um, some of the topics we briefly touched on tonight. So do we have any questions? I'll give you guys a minute or two if you're thinking. Anything else, Jesse and Laura, that you want to let people know about before we go? No, I don't think I have anything to add for tonight. Hey. Oh, someone did post a question, though, about signing up for the next class. Oh, okay. Um, oh, there we go. So if you registered, um, since you registered for this one, the link is going to be the same. And so you don't actually have to register for the next class. I will open it again for folks that may have missed the opportunity the, this first go round. But um, Janet, you'll just be able to use the same link and I'll send folks a reminder and that'll get you into all of the sessions in the series. Thank you for joining us, Tressa. I hope I said your name right. And Sarah, it looks like somebody had, what's the May 11th one? I don't have these written down in front of me either. Um, let me see, May 11th is i believe that's the hunt the hunt yes the hunt is may 11 so where to hunt who to hunt with ethics and emotions finding using things like onyx maps i'll throw that teaser out there for you is that what you were asking kathy did we answer the right question and then i see any recommendation on on where to go to learn to shoot that's a really good question 
Um, there are shooting ranges around the state. Uh, there aren't a lot of places that actually offer classes, but it's definitely worth checking out in your area to see if there are places that um, will teach you to shoot. Once in a while, we, we will do classes for bow. Um, probably the best thing is to you know, ask around friends and family, see if you know anybody already that um, goes out and shoots. If not, uh, you know, let me know. I might know somebody in the area that could could give you some tips and pointers because you really can't learn unless you have someone kind of with you sh showing you the ropes and even just getting comfortable handling your own firearm um, is really important. So uh, get, do a little check-in and we can maybe help you if you can't find any resources in your area. And Sarah, I actually just joined a gun range north of Great Falls here. We took our safety class on Saturday okay. and the instructor, I, I'm not sure what area um, Jess is in, but uh, they were talking about a women's shooting class. And cool. I, even though I feel comfortable shooting, I was actually going to email the instructor and get some more information about it. And I'd mm -hmm. be happy to pass that along to anyone that's in the Great Falls area too. Yeah, I feel like Billings has some opportunity as well. Uh, there's a pretty big range there. And I think they do some, a few of our folks, even uh, some of our volunteers will teach classes. They may be uh, handgun specific, but I think they do some other ones as well. So by keeping an eye out um, for our kind of classes. And then, yeah, I think more and more shooting ranges are kind of getting with the times and doing these how to you know women's shooting classes specifically so just even in the last couple of years i've seen a lot more opportunity coming across uh, than usual so and there are i mean it's kind of the same thing but a lot of areas have shooting clubs just people to get together and a lot of times they're little old men who are ridiculously sweet and they love to see especially younger people like people younger than them getting involved and women they're just like oh my gosh let me show you all the stuff and they're ridiculously sweet usually yeah totally i can attest to that even here in helena at our uh, local trap club they'd love to come over and give you pointers if you want some if you don't just let them know politely that you don't need any but uh usually they're pretty uh pretty happy to help out um yeah, there might be there might be some places in Three Forks and Bozeman. Um, I'll have to do a little digging and look around. We do have a newer shooting range here in Helena. I'm not sure if they have been offering classes. I think it might have changed ownership once, but uh, it's actually an indoor shooting range, and I think they might be doing doing some opportunities. Um, okay, I don't think I've missed any questions. I haven't seen any more. Okay, yeah, we're just really happy that you guys are coming on this journey with us and. Uh, as I said, we're just going to dive deeper every time we get together and uh, hope you guys enjoy it. And if you have any feedback or anything, feel free to email me. Um, but otherwise, we'll, we'll see you at the next class. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much for attending. Hope you have a great rest of your evening. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Yes.